2018. It's brought to you by Dynamic Partner Connections. I'm Joe Carroll, the Director of Dynamic Partner Connections, and Jeff Suen with Microsoft is going to be the speaker for today. Dynamic Partner Connections is about improving the success of your business, Dynamics Partner Businesses, through the community. We deliver these sessions at no charge. Our goal is to help you be successful, and our mantra is to have partners helping partners whenever and as often as possible. So today we have Microsoft, but um, in the future you'll see sessions where we have more partner best practices and partners sharing what works, what doesn't work, how do you overcome obstacles, things like that. But with the with the recent launch of 2015, we thought it was good to go one time through, and today's session actually is about the, the next wave or, or a, a repeat of what we delivered on site um, with Reimagine or with uh, the Partner Connections event. Three things about Dynamic Partner Connections. You've already gotten on our website, and we appreciate that. Get in. Check out the content library. Jeff has delivered several really, really good webinars. If you haven't viewed them, I encourage you to look up SL on our content library. Check those out. Also check out other topics that might be useful. We have lots that cross products. And get active. We have an advisory council for SL, and there's always an opportunity for folks to speak and share their experience. This is one in a series of SL 2015 readiness sessions. and It's an encore of an event that was held in St. Louis in October called the Partner Connections event. We have a series of these scheduled. Uh, this is the first one before the end of the calendar year, and there are four more scheduled over the months of January and February. And after that, there's going to be a live event the day before Convergence in Atlanta, March 15th, pregame. That's when we introduced the whole SL world into the dynamic community worlds and to dynamic partner connections. And we're thrilled this year to have a whole day or a whole set of sessions, actually half a day, that will be dedicated to uh, live on-site opportunities to learn about SL and the most important stuff to help you be successful. So please check it out. Check out your emails as they come in and register for that. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Jeff Suen to talk about today's subtopic, Dynamics SL 2015. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting. So are we ready to record? Yep. All righty. Start sharing my screen. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time to attend today. I know it's a busy time of year. But I do appreciate your time, and for those of you watching it, hopefully you will glad that you took some time out of your week to attend as well. So today I'm going to go over SL 2015 features. Uh, you may have seen me do this type of sessions for customers. Uh, this is definitely more geared to the partners. The focus here is that we can go a little bit deeper. We can talk to you about the things that you should be thinking of as these new features are available to you. So again, thank you so much, and let's get started. We've got a lot to get through. So the first enhancement that comes in SL 2015 comes around the idea that when you log into SL, one of the great functionality of SL is the fact that we do allow you to see multiple companies and also set up multiple companies. Now, a lot of the products, some of the other products, you have to buy add-ons to do that, but it is a core feature of SL that if you've got one division that works on construction, one's on service, one's on professional service, one is financials, that's okay, that's exactly the way the product is built, to be able to handle those different needs inside of one solution. But here's a question that came up, is, hey Jeff, we've now got 15, 20 different companies, and when people are logging and switching between companies, they're seeing these lists of companies that I don't want them to see. I would rather them just see the items that they are part of. So we are happy to say that now when they log into Dynamics SO, they're only going to see the companies that they are a part of. So no longer do you see them all, you just see the ones that you have access rights to. So huge help there, making it easier for the people that log into the system to know exactly what is theirs and not letting them have to worry about, hey, what is this company? I have no idea what they are. Should I go into it? Well, this will keep you out of having to do that. 
some of the things that I was thinking of as you start to use this feature, again, a lot of times we kind of default to giving people access to everything. We kind of do the all company. Um, definitely a, a reason to kind of revisit with your customers when you go up is, you know, really should Jeff have access rights to all the companies or is it really just the one company you want him in? So definitely something to think about. Also, the navigation menu generally shows you the last companies that you've tried to log into. You might think about setting that back to zero and hitting the clear button because that will remove any remnants of old companies that people tried to log in. So let's say I tried to log into company ABC. I don't have access, but I clicked on ABC, so it's still in my list of recently nav navigated. But one thing I thought of is setting that back to zero and having it clear out and, and then trying to move forward with that. Again, just a little tip of things that I think makes sense as you start implementing these new features. Now the next area is around metadata, a huge, huge ask for a long time ago, but you might say metadata, what does that mean? Well, the idea is we've got our standard ROI interface that really hasn't changed much over the years. And when you go into the report, you say this is a great report, but hey, I only want to see it for something specific. When you log into it right now, you do an F3 on the field and you get this lovely field.name. Hmm. Well, if you're a long time user of SL, you've probably adapted or talked to you, uh, you know, you guys have known enough because you've had to work with it to figure out what are the fields that are actually important on this, you know. Oh, it's ACT, T means account. Okay, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Now, prior to SL 2015, that's all you got. And we're excited here that in SL 2015, we've given you a lot more options here. First, we have a way to give you the full description. It's not just what is this? It's the account code. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Or it's the account type or this account status. Obviously, the important thing to the end user, this is, makes them very happy, is that they actually can read what the heck this thing means. So that's huge. The next is the report field. Is the field even on the report? Another great feature because a lot of times if someone came in, came in and said, I want to run it on the you know, project account category, well, I'm sorry, but we're not using that field in the report, so don't use that. You might say, well, why does it show up? Well, it basically shows all fields uh, that are out there, so account.whatever is being displayed. So it's going to show up and it's going to be there. But now we have a way for you to say, okay, let's go ahead and make sure that that information uh, is Muted. no longer, you know, uh, that the information there is not actually new available, so don't choose this field. So a great field that allows you to choose whether or not you're going to see that information. So great for that. Now, again, this brings us to our other types of reports, which are view reports. Of course, if you're like me, you're a VR underscore 01610 view favorite. So again, we're giving you that information, which I think it even makes more sense here, is that actually we have a full description that we can look at. We have our report field as we had before. The new field that we have also is the source field. And I think this is important to anyone who's going to look to potentially customize this view in the future. You know, where in the world did it get account type? It shouldn't be pulling this in. Well, you can track it that this actually came from the account field table and the account type field. You have a way to trace it backwards to find out that information. Something that you didn't have before. You'd actually have to open up the report and try to figure out in theory right here, we're giving you a little insight as to how that view was created. So as a consultant, you can look at it and say, ah, oh, this is what they used to pull it in. And then you know, if you open up the view, what you might need to look in pulling. If something's missing, something might not be pulling in correctly. Gives you a nice little way to view, hey, exactly what do I need to do here? So again, along with adding description report field, we also now add the source field, which is a great way to be able to figure out that information. So very good. We've got the idea of setting up uh, the report fields. And now they actually mean something to us. So along the same line as selecting fields, so if I select the lovely field here like the account field, one of the other long time asks is that now we'd like to be able to have a way to look up valid values. So if I said, hey, I'm looking for where the account, now I know what that means. That means account is equal to is it equal to a value? Now, what do you have to do prior to 2015? You actually mean to know what the value is. You need to look it up. But now here in 2015, we have an actual valid lookup list. What a concept.
So now you have the lookup list. You can choose the value you want. So oh, it was 1,004. Excellent. Now, that's great. I mean, huge, huge, something we've wanted for as long as I've been working on the product. So now we have that functionality. Now, the next thing is, well, what if I start using other operators like the between? Now, what is the format? Is it 1004 comma space or put it in quotes? Well, I'm happy to say that we've helped you out with that as well. Because if you're like me and you forget the formats because you might not use them every day, if we say, yep, it's 1004 through the value 1012, you select the begin and the end, click OK, and it builds it for you on the side, on the right on the spot. Now, as you see in the background, it's still using the same, but we're making the front end to getting to this much easier to do. Especially, let's say, if we're using something like an in, which, you know, again, I'm assuming it's all commas, but let's verify that. So if I do a lookup list on in, now we've got a nice interface that allows us to add things on the fly. And I can even say, yep, it's, I know I could scroll down and find the value, but I know the value I want is 9999. I click on it, it adds it to the list for me. After I click OK, it's then it went ahead and built the statement for me. So now I've got the values and I've got my field lookup list all available to me. Now, so that's obviously a great enhancement. And what I've included in the slide deck is when we provide this to you as well is I've included all the screenshots around that. Include your information on the field column. When does that field get set to yes? Well, if the field is actually being displayed or is on the report but being suppressed from printing, then that value is set to yes. If it is not on the report, obviously it's going to set to no. But here's the other option. If it's being used in a formula but not actually being used on the report anywhere, it's still going to default to no. So it might be in a formula, but if you really doesn't impact the report, if it's not actually being displayed or suppressed, um, it will be set to the value of no. Now the next common question I get is, that's great, but what if I don't like the value that you put into the system? Well, we can change those lookup values, the lookup list of fields right inside of Dynamics SL using the field description maintenance screen. So how it works is first you need to tell us the table name. So we go into table name and I'm going to look up the table account as that was one of our examples here. What I did is you can see is that out of the box I can then choose the field name to go with that. So it's the account table. I have a look up list of all the valid fields. I chose ACCT. It shows me that when ACCT is used, it's going to use the value of GL chart of account code. Kind of lengthy. Maybe it's not something that you want to have. I agree, it definitely is my account code. So what I can do on this screen is change it to the value account code. What this means that now whenever someone's pulling up a report in Dynamics SL and they're pulling up the account field, it's going to display the value account code, which if you recall, that's what it displayed on my screen. Now another one very common is, well, what about user fields? It's going to default to saying user field. That's not really going to make a lot of sense. To us, user one means location. So we can do the same thing here. We can actually define the value here and say that user one is location. Great bit of op opportunity to update that. It also brings to mind if you're using custom tables. And of course, our, your custom tables won't be in the system at all. No problem. Pull them up here in this screen and start giving us the values you want us to use for those. So very, very cool. A little bit in the background of what are the new tables, because I always get that question. Um, again, you can print this out when I send it or get it. Again, there's a new field called SL field, one called view mappings and user field description uh, that help us do exactly what we just showed you here, allowing you to set it up. Now, you could. Could you go in? Sure, you could go in the background. I just wanted to give you some as partners hey, what are those new fields that are in the table so you can use them? All right. Again, just giving you some more screenshots once this is over of all those great new features to show off to your colleagues. Now, the next one comes around email capabilities of our reports. Now, if you guys remember, unfortunately, in SL 2011, we lost some capabilities. The team that created our report writer, which you're familiar with the Crystal Report Writer, 
made some adjustments, not to our likings, but they obviously have the chance to do this. They used to have the ability that when you would preview a report that you could email it. Well, unfortunately, they removed that. So here in SL 2015, what we've done is we've actually written the code to bypass and not worry about them getting rid of it. We wrote our own code, added it to the trial balance report for any, any report, crystal report, SSRS report is available here. And what happens is you come in, you click on the button, it pulls up an interface that says, okay, well, what do you want to save it as? A lot of time I'm going to guess you're going to save it as a PDF. Click OK, and then it will interface with your email and allow you to automatically send. So here's an example here. Here's where the button here is on our crystal report. Here it is in an SSRS report just to show you that, yes, that button is available. And then it will interface with your Outlook. So it will open up Outlook, attach the file automatically, and then you just need to go ahead and start typing in your address. So you have that full capabilities. Another question, and I thought I left it on there, but I might have hidden it, is as far as what it does, it does look for Outlook. Now, Outlook can be interfaced to whatever you need it to, but it is looking for the Outlook client to be able to interface with it. The next is around report controls. If you're familiar with that, the idea of report controls is that when you open up a report, like the ones we were looking at, let's say in this trial bounce report, we have that ability that when you log in, that you can have more than just the trial balance report. In this case, we have different formats. We can do one that's combined total or debit and credit totals. And prior to SL 2015, you had the option for eight different formats. Well, we've removed that limitation, and now it is pretty much to say unlimited, meaning you can type in as many as it will be supported by the grid, which is like 15,000 or something like that. So you would. I don't know I'd want to go that high. Your drop-down list would be controllably large, but we now can at least go past that eight limit. So in this case, you can see I've added to the end additional two. The big difference is in the past, this used to be set fields. There was a, it wasn't a grid. You couldn't put it what you wanted into it, but now you have that functionality. Now you might say, oh, that's really great, Jeff, but what if it turns out that these new custom fields or custom report formats, they're actually the ones that I want to be the default. Am I assuming I need to copy it out, re-put it in a different order, and paste it back in? I know Excel is great. I could do that. Well, luckily, you do not need to do that. What we've done is added another field, which I'll, I'll come back to this. We've added another f place where you can go into the system. You can say, OK, you know what? When I'm running a report, this is the default report format I want to use. So we've got default, excuse me, default report format maintenance screen where I can go through and either specify by company or for an entire all the companies that when this report comes up, in this case the GL transaction report, I want it to default to the format of posted. So when I open up, there it is, it defaulted to posted. Now as always, I can change the format. It's just if that is the one that generally people are going to use, we are enabling you to go ahead and define that information. So a great way is now that we have all that information, how do you do that? Some additional information for you as a partner. Here is just some of the new the tables. We've always had report control. You're probably very familiar with that. But now we have this new report format table. And again, you can see this, some of the, an example here, some of the data uh, in there. You've got your file, file name, format name, and so forth. So just to give you kind of a heads up, hey, what did we do in the background? Well, we're, we're populating some new fields to take advantage of the need, the fact that we have the ability to go beyond eight now. So definitely some changes there. The next one is uh, the, around, around the, uh, sorry, around this particular enhancement is where are we storing this new information? So we have some company header and report default format tables that are in your system database as well. So we're adding new fields. Definitely be on the lookout for them. Uh, the idea is that out of the box, it's going to default to using what it's always used, usually the top one. But if you start putting information into this table, it will be available for you to set the new defaults. Now, here's a really big one around custom reports. What's the one thing that we all have to do that we don't like to do is that we know whenever we go to a new version of SL, we, meaning Microsoft Dynamics SL, will blow away your report control table. We'll clear it all out and build it from scratch. I'm happy to say that we are no longer doing that. 
meaning that so far we are not going to blow everything away. If we leave it as is, if we find things that have changed, we might add a new format if we've done something or try to update an existing one. But the whole idea of blowing everything away and rebuilding it, it's not the way that we're doing it anymore. Now, as always, I would always request that you definitely back up your report control, you know, export it, save it, have it somewhere just in case. Uh, there might be some oddity that you have set up in, your, in a system that we haven't taken into account. So as always, we would request you that you do back it up, but we're hoping here to, to save you a lot of time and a lot of headache by allowing it not to do that as you move forward. Now the next set of features are going to move on from our project area, which you can see we've done, a, we've done a lot there. We've answered, I think, a lot of the common requests that we have up to a new area around project and the whole idea of project multi-company. Now we've got different areas of multi-company. The first one is around processing. So what does this mean? Well, in the past we had processes like the allocation process. And as you can see on the screen, to be able to run this, you have to log into the CBS company and you need to click on the Allocate Company button. So if I click on Allocate Company, it will automatically allocate it just for the CBS company. Hey, Jeff, I need you to run it for company ABC. Well, what it meant is I need to log into ABC, open up the allocation process screen in there. Now, of course, we've made it easier to switch companies, which made it nice, but here's what I like about this new one now. You can be in one company and choose to run it for any different company. So I can run it for CBS, ABC, XYZ. Again, I can run it one at a time, or I can choose all and have it run for all of the companies that are out there. So you have that flexibility now. Where in the past it was, hey, Jeff, log out, log into another company. So a great bit of functionality that allows you to see everything that you need and run it for the companies that you need. Now we have a couple other examples of how that worked, uh, which we'll show you here just in a second as well. The next is around reporting. Everyone's familiar with the company selection tab in your ROI, but in the project world we knew about it, understand it, and understand it completely that it didn't do a thing to our reports. The way that the reports and the preprocesses were written, they didn't look to this tab at all to decide exactly what to report. Well, I'm happy to say here in 2015, we actually do. So this company selection tab is now a valid tab that you can use to choose one, two, multiple companies to be able to print out your reports. So big, big change there, and hopefully that'll make it easier for people to view. Next is around security. Jeff, I've given you access rights to projects in company ABC. I've got 20 different companies out there with projects in every company. What will happen when you come into the system? Well, when you do a lookup inside of the project modules, you will see every single project. No matter what company you're in, you're seeing them all. Have fun. Hmm. Well, you know what? If I only have access rights to the projects and company CBS, that's really all I want you to let me, let me see. Well, the answers have the, question to, the answer to your request has happened. Here in 2015, what we can do now is I can set it up and say that for only company CBS, if that's all you have, that's all you're going to see. Now, if I have access to multiple companies, I'll see multiple companies' project listed, no matter which company I'm in. It's not saying you can only see in CBS, but if I have access to multiple ones, I'll see as many different companies' projects as I have access rights to. So obviously helping a lot, especially if, you know, really my job is just to choose project inside of my company. It's going to help me out a lot. I'm not going to see a lot of the, the stuff that's in other areas. Now, in other areas, you know, we saw the example of running the allocation screen. Here's a couple other examples, you know, the time in a, uh, review and approval, time card status. You can either run it for a specific company or run it for all. Again, saving you that time of having to log out and log in. We've added in the time card status as well. Just another example of those screens. Um, transaction detail inquiry. We now have that idea of the company listed, so you can go and see by company what's out there. Now, that's so that's a apologize. That's the multi-company enhancements. Lots. And if you really think about it, just to keep in mind, we have touched a lot of tables out there. 
um, to be able to keep track of this, to do some things that weren't being being touched. So you know, that there were definitely, if you're wondering, hey, did we touch any project tables? Most definitely. And the next feature in the multi-currency, you can see, you'll find out in a second, this one we touched a lot too because there was a lot of uh, limitations that we had in the past that are now been removed because of this new functionality. Now, what is that? Well, if you are familiar with the project area and multi-currency, in the past, if I was at a company and our base currency is U.S. dollars and we get a new project and it's in Canadian dollars, you know what? We want to keep track of the Canadian. We want putting people putting information in. We want to see budgetary information. What is your option today? Well, your option today is I'm going to create a brand new database whose base currency is project is a Canadian. Now, why is that? Well, prior to SL 2015, you could not store the company currency or the project currency. They could not be different because there was only one set of fields for storing that information. Well, I'm happy to say that that is no longer a limitation. What do I mean by that? Well, we are actually storing the company-based currency and the project-based currency at the same time for all the transactions. So what does this mean? Well, a simple example here is now, if my base currency is US dollars, I can go ahead and set up my project currency to be Canadian dollars. What it really means is that it actually truly is storing all the transactions in Canadian dollars as well as the base currency of US dollars. So a big, big change. What does this mean? Well, as a simple example, we could have your base currency be US, your project-based currency be Canadian, your invoicing be yen, and subcontracts be pesos. Now, some of these features have been there, but just to show you that you do have that functionality here. And in the past, you might have moved people to separate application databases just for that fact. We're happy to say that you can bring them back in or make adjustments. Now, where do I turn this on? Well, under Project Controller, you will have the ability to turn on the currency billing and the project maintenance billing. As you, the currency billing has always been there, but you now have the ability of activating foreign currency for project maintenance. Now, if you turn it off, obviously it won't allow that. But if it's something that you need at your company, you do set that up in the Project Controller setup screen. And just again, another example showing you here, example of how Yes, there are new screens, or new fields in the project maintenance screen. Now, the next one that you need to think about is the fact that this multi-company functionality is taking information from projects from one currency to another. So what do we need? Well, of course, we need the multi-currency module. Now, the other thing you need to think about is you need to define all the different translations not just from like if my base is US and I need to go to pesos or to Canadian dollars, I just can't go per US to one of those. I need to actually switch it around. I need to be able to go from you know, pesos to Canadian dollars or Canadian dollars to pesos. So we need to make sure that we define all the different possible translations that could happen. It's a very important thing to make sure that you're setting up. Again, this is more for you guys as the, as the consultants doing this, but definitely something to keep in mind as well. Now, another cool thing is that because we can define these things and they're stored in the database, I can be looking at a project, and let's say I'm looking at the project and it's US dollar because that's the base currency. I could go ahead and click and change that to the Canadian dollars. And so now my Canadian dollars would display. So I can see my budgetary information as well, be able to see it in US dollars as well as in the currency of the project. All right, that's a little bit duplicate there. So big change, and think about that. We had to change all the tables that had any type of transactional information in there that just was storing the base to also add that. So keep that in mind. That was a, a big change there. Now the next area is around sales tax. If you remember sales tax, sales tax, you have the idea of being able to define the sales tax, whether the sales tax would go to the document level or to the transaction line level. And in the idea of project, we didn't really look at it because we didn't, basically the way we worked is we always went to the document level. Okay, what does that mean, Jeff? Well, it means prior to SL 2015, I'm in here, I'm putting in one project line item, another project line item, and I've got different sales tax amounts. 
what would happen is it when it went to release, it would look to the header and say, I know you put in these two different projects, but all I'm going to do is look at the header, see what the project is, because I'm always going to default to the document level, see what that is, total up the taxes, and put it all against that project. Well, that's probably not what you wanted. You probably wanted to go over, I and mean, you could set it up to go to the header, but you might say, well, but this line item I need to go against its own, you know, for that specific project. Well, I'm happy to say that now we have that functionality, and here's something new. So, again, when you set up a tax ID, you can set it either up as a line item or a document. It's a setting that's in the sales tax over under uh, shared information, under foundation. So let's say this first line item, I set them up as line item sales tax. The second line item, I set that tax up as a document sales tax. So when I release it, you'll notice that the first line item came over. Here's the sales tax for that first line item. The second, it created a line item entry for the document project because I told it that I wanted the sales tax for the second one to be document. So you have complete control now. So if you know, I always want this project's line items to default to the document, but these line items want to default to the line items. Again, you can set that up for your tax IDs. So great bit of functionality now available here for project as well. So it's actually definitely adding on to that need. So big, big change there. The next is around vendors and our 1099 vendors. Now, the idea behind the 1099 vendors, we need to set them up with the proper information, uh, tax ID numbers, confirming things, making sure they're compliant. Because if they are not compliant, it is up today to us today, prior to SL 2015, it's up to us to go through the system and say, you know what, this guy isn't compliant. We need to withhold from paying him. So if it's $1,000 we're supposed to pay him, we need to pull out the 20%, which in this case would be a couple hundred dollars. So right now today you could do this, but it all is manual and it's all process you need to think about doing. So what we've added here in SL 2015 is to automate that process. First, you have the ability to whether you want to turn on backup withholdings or not. Yes, we want to do it. No, we do not. So if you don't need it, obviously you'd leave it off. No, no harm, no foul. Now the next is to set your backup withholding percent, and that generally is 20 percent. I apologize for the 5 percent in the screenshot, but generally it's going to be which has been defined, which I think today would be around 20 percent. The next is a ability to turn off a warning message, which we'll see here in a second, how to turn that on, um, what that message is, but you can turn it off if, you know, the idea of this warning message is to let you know, hey, by the way, you're about to do a backup withholding, just wanted to let you know, but as you get maybe three, six months down the line, you might say, you know, quit telling me that, I know that, um, that's what we want it to do, don't, don't bother me with that request. And then lastly, where do you want me to put this information, what account and sub-account should I post it to, so you have that ability as well. So once that's set up and you click save, the first time you're going to save, it's going to say, hey, Jeff, I noticed you just turned on backup withholdings. Would you like me to search through all your vendors? I'm going to look for all your 1099 vendors. And if I find any issues, I'm going to turn up the backup withholding flag from no to yes for you so you don't have to do it. So if I do so and I come in here, you'll see that what it did is it went through. It looked at a couple different places. First, it's looking at your tax ID number. If you don't have a tax ID number and you're a 1099 vendor, it's a surefire thing for it to say, uh, there's an issue, backup withholding. Second is if you do have a tax ID number but it hasn't been validated or something's wrong with it and you've chosen this whole tax ID and note incorrect notice, if you've chosen that once or twice, whatever it happens to be at, that will also trigger to say, hey, turn it on. Okay, so it turns it on for me automatically. If Jeff would I want to turn it off, no problem come into the screen, just click the drop-down box and change it from yes to no. Now, how will it work when I actually try to enter data? Well, it's going to pop up a screen whenever I choose a vendor that has that and I leave the warning message on. It's going to say, hey, by the way, these guys are subject to backup withholdings. Just wanted to let you know before you move forward. So it lets me know that. Now, where will this happen? Well, any place you can enter in information like that. For example, the voucher adjustment entry screen, the quick voucher, the voucher, voucher entry distributed liability. You have it. That's where it's going to be able. Now, once the data is in there and it processes, how will I actually be able to view it? Well, you can go back into vendor maintenance or vendor history. 
And you'll view it either in the document tab, in the history screen, different areas like that to be able to view exactly what went through. And here's just a couple screenshots of some of the areas. So for example, here's the vendor maintenance screen. Here's your backup withholding type. We also have in the vendor history, we have a new column called PTD backup withholdings, so period date backup withholdings, a whole new area for that. And then also it is storing this information, obviously, it's storing the information in your 1099 balances. Uh, it's also putting things, some additional fields that we're using to store this information as the example shows right here. All right, so some great things around that as well. So the next area is around accounts payable. And the change here is that we have added the vendor name to all of our checks along with the vendor ID. So what does that mean? Well, prior to the past, we understand that when we release a check, there's a temporary check entry, and then there's the permanent check once it gets processed and approved and uh, said that, yep, this check went through okay. So in the past, all we would do is store the ID, but now what we're storing is a, the vendor ID plus the vendor name. Well, why is that important? Well, if today the name of the company uh, is Baldwin Science, and we cut a check for them, and you know it's in the system. But let's say, for example, tomorrow they change, and now they're called the Dynamic Partner Connections. Well, if we happen to, for some reason, choose to use the same ID, if all we did is store ID, someone would come back and say, why in the world is this check made up to Baldwin Science? They're called Dynamic Partner Connections. Well, what we'll be doing now is storing both of the names at the time of cutting the check in the system so you can better see and understand that, oh, that's why they were called. It appears that at that time that was their name, so you have a track of that information. Now the next area we're going to look at is previewing invoices. And if you know like I know, when you are in Dynamics SL, the best time to edit something is before you actually release it. Because we know that if we go ahead and we release something, we lose that ability to preview it. Because obviously, like most good accounting problem products, if you release and post things to your uh, to the general ledger, well it's in the general ledger. We don't want you to reverse it. If you need to make an adjustment, we want you to make an appropriate adjustment so you have complete record of all those items. Well, what we have now is that if I pull up an item, let's say, I'll pick up, a, that's not a good one, let's pull up one that has some values in it. If I pull up a batch, let's say, this one here that has a lot of money in it, and the question might be, hey, I've got this great item out here, looks pretty good on screen, but what if I want to take a look at it, what it might look like as an invoice? Well, we've got a new button called Invoice Preview that will pop it up on the screen, and we can quickly look at the information. Um, I can see what's here. I can say, oh, there's an issue. Uh, it's missing a description. Oh, I've got the wrong ship to, build to. I need to change something. It's really great because it does provide you a way to look at it. But note these following items. One, this is a new report. This is not an existing report. This is a brand new SSRS report. So if you've already customized the invoice report for your customer, you're going to have to customize this one as well. Two, think about adding additional information that might not be on your final invoice. Maybe you want to start using it for more of a visual OK. You know, maybe you add in accounts and subaccounts because you want to do that as well. Um, looking to you as the, the partners to really take this particular report and make it work best for your customers. We give you the great basic information, but I'm assuming it's a good opportunity for you to revisit with your customers on what do they need to look at before they approve and release the batch. Now, you might say, that's great, Jeff, but that means I also have to open up every single batch and every single invoice number and then hit the button. Well, we saw that one coming too, so we created another screen called the AR Invoice Preview screen. And the thing I like about this screen, it's really a combination of two great screens. One, it is a quick query at heart on the left-hand side here. So I'm able to add filters, do all the normal things I would like to do. I can you know, push it out to Excel, all the stuff you're, you're used to seeing, all available here on the left-hand side. But what on the right-hand side is a preview screen. So as I'm clicking on the different items, and I'll wait because I know there's a, sure there's a delay seeing it, 
But as I click on every line item, it is updating this invoice preview on the right-hand side. So I'm able to see them really quickly. Now the other really cool thing is that as I'm in it and I go, you know what, yep, missed something here. Because it is a quick query, I can right-click on it and drill back into the original screen. So now I can make edits to it, make the adjustments, maybe even come back and check it out again, and then go forward. So some great functionality around this whole preview invoice. And again, I've left some screenshots in here so you can show this off or remember some of the great features it has. The big question, you said it was a custom report, Jeff. Where is it and what's the report name? Well, here it is. And again, we will print this out and post this out there so you can get a copy of this as well. Or you can obviously email me as always. The next feature is around prepayments. You have the ability to apply multiple AP prepayments against a single voucher, something you could not do prior to SL 2015. So we've added new tables to do this, and let's kind of walk through an example of you know, what's the end user experience when they want to do multiple prepayments. Well, of course, you have the voucher and adjustment answer screen. You do have a button that says multiple prepayments, so that would be a clue that it is something new. But then when I come into and click on it, it will pop up the screen and I can go ahead and apply one of them or again I can add in the second one choose another one and apply it as well so just showing you the fact that yes I can apply multiple prepayments against here um, by coming into the screen and choosing the different prepayment numbers that are available to me so a great bit of functionality uh, this enhancing what we've had again it used to be only one prepayment that you could apply New table behind this that's allowing this. You can see the name of the table here uh, in case you're wondering, hey, how are you able to accomplish that? We've added another table to store that information as well. Now the next area is around payroll, an area that doesn't always get a lot of love and attention, but I can say we've done a great job in my mind of making some of the existing features so much nicer for the end user. Um, I'm going to skip actually describing them and kind of go to my I mean, you'll get these full descriptions, so don't worry. But I'm going to go to my demonstrations because I think it brings home the point a little bit easier. Now, one of the things is that when you release your checks, you can use the review and edit check screen to make adjustments. Say, oh, I forgot something and I don't want to rerun the whole thing. So we have this screen built to do this. Now today, if I looked at this and went, oh, you know what? Current amount's 100. It should have been 120. What I would have to do today is I would have to manu manually calculate what all the values should be. So if I put it at the 120 today, nothing else would be changed below it. It would be up to me, Jeff, and you guys don't want that to happen. You want me to go through and actually remember to update what the Fed thought one should have been, the Fed two, based on that value. So what we've done here in SL 2015 is if I change the value from 100 to 120, it's going to say, hey, You've made a change. I'm going to go ahead and calculate the changes to the subject earnings. Okay, cool. And then it's also going to tell you, by the way, I looked and checked, and this is all the fields that I just updated for you. So I click OK and hit refresh. You see now that the values have changed below without me, the end user, having to do anything. Huge, 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 because you could imagine what a big hole that opened up or nightmare of people miscalculating or not realizing that they, hey, if you make a change here, you actually have to change the values below. So we're saving you, in my mind, saving you from a big nightmare. Uh, if you've any payroll customers, definitely bring this to them. Or if they saw this before and decided not to go with payroll, I think you've got a pretty good reason to do this as well. Now another area here is that if you are going to void checks. Uh, in the past, if you voided a check, you would have to then usually rerun processes to get the values because the values, for example, if they're coming from uh, from the time card entry screens, one thing would happen, you have to reactivate them or re-enter them, and here it would get really complicated because SL would think, or the project side would say, hey, we've already entered our time for this week, what do we need to do? Or you might have to rerun uh, calculation process, you know, calculations, re-enter timesheet information, Make sure you don't overstate the project amounts. I'm kind of reading here, but again, if you have payroll, you have to rerun the interface. You know, if anything came from payroll, payroll, lots of things. Great thing here now is that all you need to do is, as you're voiding the check, is turn on this little button here. 
reactivate earnings. You don't have to re-enter, you don't need to do those things, you just need to rerun that, that calculation process and boom, the information's still there. So that is huge. That was, again, a lot, a lot to do. All right, the next one is around gross checks. Now, if you talk to any payroll people and say, hey, have you ever, ever heard of the net check entry screen? I'm pretty much guaranteeing you are highly recommending that most people don't know about this screen. And the reason why is that this screen has so many restrictions on it when it was first made that it made it kind of unusable. What did I mean? Well, the net check entry screen could only work with certain types of earnings. So even though you had your regular earning type defined, as you can see chosen here, more than likely there was something in it that this screen didn't support. So what it would mean is that you'd create your regular earning types that you'd use for your payroll all the time, and then you'd have to create a different earning type because it had limitations. Which might make you say, well, geez, if it can't do everything I wanted to do, why would I use it? Which I would turn to you and go, I agree with you. So what I'm happy to say is that those restrictions that used to happen in the screen that you couldn't use a lot, some of the earning types have been removed. Check it out, very, very cool. This means that you can actually start using the net check entry screen. So for example, if I wanted to get, you know, pay someone $1,000 for a bonus, I can put that in there and release it and you can see that it's actually putting it into review, check at it. Here's how much the net check earning was, here was what the gross earning amount was, it's automatically, the, done all the deductions, a Fed 1, Fed 2, it's doing that all for me. Something that I did not have before I had to, I couldn't do this. So to me, huge, huge change. Again, if you're payroll people out there, let them know they're going to want to jump to 2015. Again, these three features alone to me are, are worth it if you are a big payroll user. Now, last but not least in the payroll area is the ability to audit your payroll information. So now we can keep track of it. If you make changes to things like pay groups or salaries, we now have a place to track this information. Uh, when you do make a change on the employee maintenance screen, it's going to prompt you, hey, you've made a change, why did you do it? It's going to require that you put something in there, recorded that it was you, and let people know. And we also can keep track of all your deduction changes as well. And we can scroll through and see all the different information that's available there. So, very good thing there. Next big feature is around Quick Query. You guys are very familiar with that feature, I'm sure. The big things around Quick Query are taking some functionality that we didn't, that we had before, and in my mind, making it even better. So, what is that? Well, we've always had the idea of doing Grid to Excel, which is still we've changed the name. That's now called Copy to Table, but you're very familiar with it. Get the data out, put it in here. Love that you're giving me the column names. I can choose the fields that I want. Now, generally, what you would do is take this information, you know, move the fields around, make a graph, do whatever you need to do. But the big downside of this, if you were to call it a downside, is that this information is static, which in some places, that's what you want. I did. I wanted to, at that time of day, at that certain time period, and that's what I wanted, the exact information that was available. So that's still available to you. But a lot of people said, you know, that's great, but what I really like is, Whenever I take this data and I export it out once, I create it into this really cool format. It looks great. People love it. And it's so much it's love now that I have to create it every year, every month, or every week. Can't you actually make my report connected so I don't have to do this every time? And that's exactly what we've done with these last three options. Now, the first one I'm going to choose is called Query Table. Similar type of interface where I just choose it a little different. It does allow me to select exactly what should be exported. Everything in the query or just what you filtered on the query? What, what's the name of the workbook? Where do I want to put it? Where do I want to start it? Some additional niceties there. But you might look at it and say, Jeff, it looks like you just did the same thing. Did you mess up? And the answer is no, I did not. Because along with creating the information and making it the way I want it, we've done something that we haven't had in the past. And we've made a connection to your data. So what's going on here? It looked and it said, Jeff, you have access to this quick query view in SL. I am now going to give you connection to that same view from Excel directly to the, uh, the view inside of SL. So it's creating that, uh, that connection. If you want to see the nitty-gritty of it, here's the string that's done that. 
but it's also created the select statement to actually update everything that you have in this table. So that means that I can move it around, make the cool charts and tables whenever I do it, save it, and then when someone says, hey, love your report, what's the latest? All I need to do is open it up, hit the refresh button, and it's done. It's refreshed it, and it's ready to go. Now we have the same thing with this connection option. Really the slightly different interface here, but the big difference here is it's creating my connection. Great, love it. The big difference, it doesn't load it into the, into the grid here automatically. It allows for you to pull it up, open it, and choose exactly what you want to do. You create another table, pivot table, pivot chart and pivot table report. What do you want to do? All those things. You might say pivot table, very cool. And we think so too, so we've actually created, a, instead of you having to load it and click that, we've also added the ability to create a pivot table over here as well. So let's say we decided to change the, uh, I knew the fields that I want to add to my pivot table are vendor ID and vendor name. I can choose to use them or not. If I click the Create button, now I've got my standard interface and I can start adding the fields that I want uh, to this, in, this information. So standard ability to do pivot tables, again, the big idea here, it is connected. It's created the connection for me so I can re uh, go ahead and refresh it as often as I'd like. So left a lot of screenshots, which I'll click through real quickly here. A lot of screenshots, again, so you can share with other people some of that great information on that. And the last one I think that I'm going to actually demo here in the user interface is the new lookup screen. Now you're very familiar inside of SL, we've got lookup lists everywhere. You call them PB lists, F3 lists, whatever you like to call them. Now in the past you had a, a nice interface, but if you look here, this has changed a bit. And the good thing about it to me is it's really changed for the better. Some things that we couldn't do in the past, like being able to support on dollar amounts or, or field um, numeric amounts, can do it now. Every field is basically sortable. Awesome, Jeff, love it. Now, what if I want to find a value? Well, we've, instead of you having to type in, you know, I want to find, click on a field and click on there and start typing in the value to find the first three characters that start with the value. Well, now we've got our quick query interface available to you. So, if I know that I'm looking for a batch that has 35 in it, all I need to do is type 35, and it's finding anywhere in the batch number where the value 35 exists. Awesome. It really changes the, the feel of the lookup list because they're now much more interactive. I can get to the data quicker. Um, you might even look at it and go, hey, that's a great bit of information. Um, I'd like to use that, and I can actually right-click on the field and export that data. Oops, let me close up my, uh, sorry, this is because I have this open. Uh, go ahead and take that data out of my lookup list, right click on it and export it to Excel. So I like that too. Excel is everywhere and it's something that now you can do even more here with SL. So again, finding it, sorting it, selecting it, get to what, getting to you what you want and moving forward. So I'm enjoying that as well. Now, one thing to think about, a lot of questions I get on this one, what happens to all my custom PV lists? No worries. We work with your custom PV list. We're not removing that functionality. It's still there, so don't worry. You can still customize them, do everything you want. Next one, database maintenance. And I apologize, I'm, I notice I'm running out of time here, so I'll try not to go too fast. But next one is synchronizing selected databases. One of the most common things you are asked to do is, hey, if you're having troubles with the database, things are acting weird is to run the synchronized database process. In the past, you used to have to run it for everything. Now you actually can choose the select specific database that's having the issue and run it. Because in the past, if you had to run it for all, you had to kick everybody out. Support is the standard support. The way we work at, it at Microsoft is usually the current version minus one. So you'll see Windows 8 minus one, so Windows 7 as well. Server 2012 and 2008 R2, the latest versions of SQL and latest versions of Visual Studio as well. Just to note, there is some changes in some of the screens will look different when you run the update process. So if you need to do the database update, you do have a slightly different look. One thing you'll notice is when you do the load your messages in PV Rex, there is no more report control CSV. No need to re-import it. We don't do it here, so you don't need to do that as well. And just to show you, uh, again, slightly different look of the interface tables that use uh, the most common look. We've made some changes. Uh, 
some of the modules have been removed. We've removed basically the OEM versions of the products. So advanced shipping used to have an OEM product. We've removed it and relabeled it shipping management and cut the price drastically. Same with e-commerce gateway EDI edition. We removed the requirement of purchasing the Edge product with it, removed it, relabeled it, cut the price down dramatically. Now you can still get those OEM products directly from the vendor. It's just by dropping them off, we've made the price a lot cheaper. Again, you can ask me about that. You've sure you've heard about web apps and you saw that from Joe that we are going to be giving a webinar next month on this. You can see what's available. We're going to be able to get next month into the details of what are the new web apps coming out in CU1 scheduled for the April timeframe. So we're excited to talk to you about those, maybe share some screenshots with those as well. As you know, we're replacing the business portal with web apps. You'll see CU1 is going to get us pretty much right on par with all the things that we needed in Business Portal. But with that, you know the roadmap. The roadmap continues on. Again, the roadmap this year in, well, in 2015 will be that we will schedule to have two releases, one in the April time frame and one in the October time frame that will add continu continually add new web app features. Again, the session we're giving in January, we'll be able to talk to you a little bit more detail on that as well. Again, SL2015 is available, available for you to start downloading and installing. That CU1 release, which is the what you would usually call service pack in the, in the past, that is coming, again, currently scheduled for the April timeframe, because if you have those customers that are usually waiting for that, that's when it's going to happen. And with that, Joe, I apologize for Unmuted. talking a lot, but we'll see if we have any questions from the team. All right, I think Joe is there. Well, if you do okay, have... Jeff. Okay, Jeff. Yeah, I was just going to say, the uh, the attention level has been great. The uh, retention of folks has been very good. So obviously, it was uh, you hit on all cylinders with the session. Right now, there are no questions, and we'll give folks a second. Um, are there any last thoughts that you might have about pointing folks in the right direction to get further help? Sure, most definitely. Um, as always, you guys have my email address there if you have any questions. A um, couple things to note on the partner source site. Definitely go out to the partner source to get information. If you get to the partner source site, click on the SL tab, and you'll see one of the hero spots will say SL 2015. Note that recently I have uploaded a series of demo mate demos and videos that are available for you. So you can show off some of these new features, uh, the reporting features that I showed off, which I know people get excited about, the features on um, uh, 1099s and the quick query, all those are there available for you to use as a demo mate demo to show off to your clients, but also as videos in case you want to share them with that as well. I'll also be updating them shortly with links to the YouTube version of, of those videos for you in case you want to point people to them as well. Uh, other things, Joe was gracious enough, we did a session on, hey Jeff, I want to be able to demo this stuff live. We have a session on taking the current SL2011 image and updating it to 2015. Did a great session on that. I've got documents available for that as well. And I guess the next time we're going to come out, currently the current schedule is to come out with our next version of the Hyper-V demo images right around that April time frame. One of my, hope, my current schedule is I'm going to have you know, a brand new image with SQL 2014 and server 2012 and all the latest and greatest cool features. But the thought is right now, because we're getting so close to the next release of web apps that we're probably going to hold out to there because we do have a solution right now. Uh, if you have any questions on that at all, please feel free to reach out to me. You know, my, my email and my cell phone are always available for your questions. Um, also, if you haven't used me yet, I do a lot of these demonstrations for partners to give to their internal folks or to give directly to your existing or, or your prospects. So as always, I am available for that. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, everyone, for joining today's call. This will end today's call.